Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Grant, O merciful God, that your church, being gathered together in unity by your Holy Spirit, may show forth your power among all peoples, to the glory of your name through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the first book of Kings. Then Solomon assembled Israel's elders, all the tribal leaders, and the chiefs of Israel's clans at Jerusalem to bring up the chest containing the Lord's covenant from David's city, Zion. The priests brought the chest containing the Lord's covenant to its designated spot beneath the wings of the winged creatures in the inner sanctuary of the temple, the most holy place. When the priests left the holy place, the cloud filled the Lord's temple, and the priests were unable to carry out their duties due to the cloud, because the Lord's glory filled the Lord's temple. Solomon stood before the Lord's altar in front of the entire Israelite assembly, and spreading out his hands toward the sky, he said, Lord God of Israel, there's no God like you in heaven above or on earth below. You keep the covenant and show loyalty to your servants who walk before you with all their heart. This is the covenant you kept with your servant David, my father, which you promised him. Today you have fulfilled what you promised. So now, Lord, Israel's God, Keep what you promised my father David, your servant, when you said to him, This is Maureen. You will never fail been to have a successor sitting on Israel's throne as long as your descendants carefully walk before me, just as you walked before me. So now, God of Israel, may your promise to your servant David, my father, come true. But how could God possibly live on earth? If heaven, even the highest heaven, can't contain you, how can this temple that I've built contain you? Lord, my God, listen to your servant's prayer and request and hear the cry and prayer that your servant prays to you today. Constantly watch over this temple, the place about which you said, my name will be there. And listen to the prayer that your servant is praying toward this place. Listen to the request of your servant and your people, Israel, when they pray toward this place. Listen from your heavenly dwelling place. And when you hear, forgive. Listen also to the immigrant who isn't from your people, Israel, but who comes from a distant country because of your reputation, because they will hear of your great reputation, your great power, and your outstretched arm. When the immigrant comes and prays toward this temple, then listen from heaven where you live and do everything the immigrant asks. Do this so that all the people of the earth may know your reputation and revere you as your people Israel do and recognize that this temple I have built bears your name. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. How dear to me is your dwelling, O Lord of hosts. My soul has a desire and longing for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh rejoice in the living God. The sparrow has found her a house and the swallow a nest where she may hang her young. By the side of your altars, O Lord of ghosts, my sovereign and my God. Happy are they who dwell in your house. 
they will always be praising you. Happy are the people whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on the pilgrim's way. Those who go through the desolate valley will find it a place of springs, for the early rains have covered it with pools of water. They will climb from height to height, and the God of gods will appear in Zion. Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Hearken, O God of Jacob. Behold our defender, O God, and look upon the face of your anointed. For one day in your courts is better than a thousand in my own room. And to stand at the threshold of the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is both sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will the Lord withhold from those who walk with integrity. O Lord of hosts, happy are they who put their trust in you. A reading from the letter to the Ephesians. Finally, be strengthened by the Lord and his powerful strength. Put on God's armor so that you can make a stand against the tricks of the devil. We aren't fighting against human enemies, but against rulers, authorities, forces of cosmic darkness, and spiritual powers of evil in the heavens. Therefore, pick up the full armor of God so that you can stand your ground on the evil day and after you have done everything possible to still stand. So stand with the belt of truth around your waist, just as, as your breastplate, and put shoes on your feet so that you are ready to spread the good news of peace. Above all, carry the shield of faith so that you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which, God is, which is God's word. Offer prayers and petitions in the spirit all the time. Stay alert by hanging in there and praying for all believers. As for me, pray that when I open my mouth, I'll get a message that confidently makes this secret plan of the gospel known. I'm an ambassador in chains for the sake of the gospel. Pray so that the Lord will give me the confidence to say what I have to say. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. The Holy Gospel of our Savior, Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory, Glory to you, Lord Christ. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. As the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me lives because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. It isn't like the bread your ancestors ate, and then they died. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. Many of his disciples who heard this said, this message is harsh, who can hear it? Jesus knew that the disciples were grumbling about this, and he said to them, does this offend you? What if you were to see the human one going up where he was before? The spirit is the one who gives life, and the flesh doesn't help at all. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and life, yet some of you don't believe. Jesus knew from the beginning who wouldn't believe and the one who would betray him. He said, for this reason I said to you that none can come to me unless the Father enables them to do so. At this, many of his disciples turned away and no longer accompanied him. Jesus asked the twelve, do you also want to leave? Simon Peter answered, Lord, where would we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are God's holy one. The gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Christ. 
Your pageantry shows what you believe. I'm not using pageantry in a pejorative sense here, but in an illuminating one. What you say, what you do, what you enact with your body is based on what you believe. It reveals something of what you believe, either the world you live in now or the world you hope to live in. And this has been abundantly clear the last few weeks as we have watched our national political parties put on conventions. They are full of pageantry, which is designed to communicate what each group values. The speakers, the messages, how veterans are involved, what symbols are used, all of that is designed to reveal deep meaning. The same thing is happening today with our story about Solomon. This text about Solomon's life is written about 400 years after he died. That would be like Shakespeare writing about Robin Hood or Disney writing about Pocahontas. So you could say that the details, the facts, are a little bit separated from the meaning. This text was written while the people of Israel were, were in bondage in Babylon, while they were crafting this political and social and theological identity, while they were asking questions like, who are we? What do we believe? What do we value? How are we different from the oppressors who are, who are around us? They were sorting through these kinds of questions. And so Solomon became more than just a person. He became a figure, a story that conveys meaning. Part of this meaning is about the glory of God. It's also about a peaceful transfer of power. It's also about Solomon being a legitimate ruler because he was seen as wise. As Sam reminded us last week, this was important because Solomon was maybe not a great ruler. <laughs> he um, was somewhat of a yes man. He surrounded himself with uh, people who wouldn't say no to him. He showed a lot of favoritism. And the first political thing that happened after he died was the northern kingdoms left and there was a rebellion and this kingdom totally fell apart. There's also some question about whether or not this temple, this magnificent temple, was even created in the time that it was created. So all of this is a story designed to tell us a message. That doesn't mean that it's not true. That doesn't mean that it's a facade. As Ed used to say all the time, stories can be true on the inside, even if they're not necessarily true on the outside. So with this story of Solomon, sometimes a dude is just a dude. And Solomon, in all of his glory, was just a dude who was good at some things and bad at some things. And we take his story and we wrap it in meaning because in doing so, it helps us to see what we value. We'll get to this story, what it might mean that Solomon values in just a minute. But it's important to realize that this is true for us, too. Our own pageantry, the images we cultivate, the stories we tell over and over again, those things shape us. Another word for pageantry might be liturgy. What we say, what we do, what we embody becomes what we believe. Now, we all have liturgies that we are part of, big and small. In my household, I married into a British family, we have a very elaborate liturgy of the tea making that happens twice a day. A liturgy is a way of paying attention because what you focus on grows. There's all this research that if you remind girls that they're supposed to be bad at math, their scores in math go down. There is a um, person I follow on Instagram, Dr. Becky Good Inside. Some of you parents might recognize her. She talks about reframing the difficult people in your life as not perhaps difficult, but as good people having a tough time. So the way you are paying attention to something shapes the way you experience it. And so Solomon is engaging in his, his pageantry. He's engaging in his liturgical practice 
and that's to communicate a message to us. One of the big things that happens in this story is this fog, this cloud comes in, which is, reminds the people of Israel like the cloud that led Moses out of Egypt. It's a way of saying Solomon is a legitimate ruler. He may be the sixth oldest child of David, and he may be the product of his uh, unfaithfulness with Bathsheba, but, but he's the real ruler. So this is a, 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 the cloud signifies that this is who God has picked as the next person. His pageantry, his liturgy also shows that God is worth investing in. The one thing we know is that Solomon was very good at international trade. He was excellent at building up the commercial strength of Israel. And the, when then he invested in this temple as part of that, whether it was as big as it says or just a significant monument, that is what Solomon did, is he invested in a permanent dwelling place for the most important things of the people of Israel. Part of this message also says that God is worth reorienting for, and that's everybody. So this story talks about how when you're in the temple, you turn and face the Holy of Holies, the Ark. When you're outside the temple, all the people of Israel, they turn and they face this temple. They turn toward God. But that expands to everyone to all foreigners, all immigrants, everyone turns and faces God. What they all have in common is what they're paying attention to, what they're turned toward. The other thing that this story reminds us is that God tends to disrupt business as usual. And we'll, get, we'll explore that more in a little bit. But this first message that all of the people on earth are oriented around this temple, this is their liturgy. To stand up, to figure out which way Jerusalem is, and then to turn their heart toward the Holy of Holies. This is what they say, this is what they do, and it shapes what they believe. That's true for us too in this place. What our liturgy does, what we do, what we say, what we enact with our, with our bodies, with our time, it says what we believe. We gather together from all parts of the city because we believe that God is drawing people together. We listen to the scriptures because we believe that in these stories, God has given us holy and good and beautiful things examples that we can use to shape our life and to shape our imagination. We reflect together, looking for ways that God is both here and God is out there, and how God is deeply invested in the way those two things are interrelated. We pray together because we believe that broken hearts need community and that God is present with those who need our prayers of concern and rejoices with our prayers of thanksgiving. We offer our lives in the symbol of putting our hands in the offering plate, recognizing that we only exist in a web of God's generosity. We eat and drink holy food, which is less food for our hungry bodies than food for our hungry hearts. It's for the parts of us that hurt inside, the parts of us that have hurt others, and when we eat and drink it, we remember that Jesus loves us and wants us to love each other. This is some of what happens here in this room. This is some of our pageantry, and it gets in our bones. But the good news is that Jesus does not just care about our churchiness. This story shows that. God disrupts business as usual, especially church business. Anytime we think we've got God in a box, God usually shows us something to prove us wrong. And I just love this image as a priest of the priests trying to do what priests do, and then this fog comes down and they just have to sit down. <laughs> it's like, guess what? Whatever you're doing is less important than what God is doing. Because the churchy stuff points to something else. It's not the end goal. We see this in the life of Jesus. Most of his liturgy, most of what he does and says and moves with his body doesn't happen in religious settings. He prays mostly in the wilderness. 
He hangs out on the bad, sort of disreputable parts of town. He eats with the weird kids. He tells stories, real stories, about human life. He mostly doesn't talk about scripture and learned things. He talks about plants and seeds and light and salt. He has friends and people who count on him, and he shows up for them. And I think that is good news because we all have liturgies outside of this building that show what you see or what you value and what you believe in. This is the easiest to see when you look at your money and your time. Something you do two hours a week here at this place has way less of your attention than what you do the one other 166 hours of the week. I mentioned that tea-making liturgy that starts and ends the day at our house. That's one way we organize our time. Besides our tithe, we also have a better world fund in our budget that we use to support local artisans, GoFundMes of friends in need. This is not our charitable giving. This is about investing in the kind of world we want to live in that has a vibrant local economy and where people take care of each other. Yesterday at the grocery store, this guy came up to me in the produce section and he said, excuse me, are you buying salad? And I said, yes, I am buying salad. And he looked in my cart and he said, oh, never mind." And he said, you're not buying the right kind of salad. And I sort of looked at him confused. And he said, every week I get two salad coupons, but I can't eat two salad coupons. I can't eat two bags of salad, they'll go bad. So I look for someone in the produce section to give my second coupon to. And if I can't find anyone, I just stick it in in front of the bag. He does that every week. That is his liturgy. He believes in sharing this salad coupon that he doesn't need with some stranger he runs into in Kroger. We have unofficial liturgies too, just like the salad coupon. Here in the middle of our service, we have this piece called the Reflections, where we make space not for the preacher to tell you what you should believe, but we say God is speaking to you, and then we build space into our liturgy for you to listen for that. We take the time for you to draw the connection between your Sunday morning and your Tuesday afternoon, between your sanctuary and your sewing room, between your places of brokenness and the world's places of brokenness, between your story and Jesus' story. I've never heard of an Episcopal church that does it that way, but we do, and it shapes us deeply. As a congregation, we have shaping liturgies with our money, too. After we pay the bills, the light bills, utility bills, and make payroll, we have about $24,000 in, in kind of movable income. That may sound like a lot to you, but that's about 7.5% of everything we bring in in a year. And of that $24,000, every year, we set aside a third of it into a fund called Beyond Our Walls. And that's a fund where all of you can say, this is a ministry I'm involved in outside the church, and I care about this, and I want my church to care about it too. And the Beyond Our Walls group says, great, here's some money for this ministry that you care about. We could do other things with that money, but as a church, we have decided what we believe, what we understand to be true, is that we do not exist only for ourselves. We exist in a substantial way to serve those beyond our walls. We put our money where our mouth is, not all of it, but enough of it that we feel it. And this is a circle, because what we say and what we do and what we enact becomes what we believe. And what we believe shapes what we say and what we do and what we act. Our daily liturgies, the things we do every day, remind us of the kind of world we want to live in. Jesus once said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. But that is such a limited way of thinking about it. What he's really saying is, what are you turned toward? Where your treasure, where your attention, where your time, where your energy, where your money is, that's what you're paying attention to. There's one more part of this story that I want to explore together because this pivotal moment 
is when Solomon has the ark moved into the temple. The people of Israel have been carrying this ark around and setting up and taking down a tent for 480 years. They've just like schlepped it all over the desert. And he moves Israel's treasure box into a place of pride. He puts it right down in the center of the room. And I love thinking about that. I don't know about you, but we have a lot of treasure boxes at our house. Some of them contain real treasures and some of them contain special rocks. Um, But we all have a treasure. We all have a treasure box, something we really care about, something that You know, I have one for my dad. It it reminds me of things that I remember about my dad. And so I can pull that treasure box off the shelf, and it tells me his story again. So inside this ark, there are four things. I think we probably all know about the first thing, which is the Ten Commandments. This is the pattern, the way to live. It's right there. It's right there that you're turning your attention to, that right relationship with God and our neighbor. According to the book of Hebrews, the two more things that are in the box are Aaron's staff, which, you know, he threw on the ground, it turned into a snake, convinced Pharaoh to let God's people go. So it's the tool of liberation is in this box. The third thing that's in this box is a jar of manna. When you kept the manna overnight, when you tried to hoard it, it rotted and went away because you were supposed to trust that God would give you enough just for the today, but this one jar never rotted. So this one jar was in the ark as a reminder that God would always provide for us. And then the last thing that was in the box comes from our Jewish brothers and sisters in the Talmud. And that tradition teaches that the broken fragments of the first set of the Ten Commandments were in the box. The fragments that that when Moses came down and the people had messed up, he threw them onto the ground and shattered into a million pieces. And someone scooped up those pieces and put them in a box as a reminder that our pain and our failures don't have to be kept secret from God. Our foibles don't disqualify us from God's love, and they are holy. They, too, are a kind of liturgy. So for Solomon, what was holy to him was God's presence being accessible to everyone. Even though he was just a dude, he believed deeply in God's presence. He also showed us that you don't have to be perfect to live in a way that is aligned with your values. So what are the things that you value, and how do you know? What fills your time? What fills your heart? What is in your treasure box, literally or figuratively? Do you wake up in the morning and turn your face to Jerusalem, turn your heart toward that thing that defines your life? Like Solomon is the biggest chunk of your discretionary funding from your bank account going to something you deeply value? How is your own life liturgy revealing what you value and revealing how you shape your attention? These are provocative questions. They are challenging questions, and they are questions to chew on for an entire lifespan. But I keep coming back to the fog, to the cloud, In many ways, Jesus is the fog, reminding us not to get distracted by the pomp and the circumstance, the window dressing. Jesus is always moving among us, disrupting business as usual, saying, you think your liturgy is so important? Just have a seat and watch. Pay attention to what I am doing. The prophet Isaiah writes, and the author of 1 Peter repeats that all human life on the earth is like grass. All human glory is like a flower in a field. The grass dries up and its flower falls off, but the Lord's word endures forever. The word is Jesus and it endures forever in cloud, in presence, in guidance, in liberation, in nourishment, in freedom. 
In Jesus, things meet their end, and in Jesus, things find their beginning. In Jesus, all that is nothing fades away, and all that is everything endures forever.